Okay. I think we can get started. We have a, a healthy crew of folks who have logged in and maybe a few more will be joining us in the next few minutes. Uh, I'm Dan Wiener. I'm the administrator of Inclusive Assessment. I'm thrilled to be here with you this afternoon, this beautiful day. I'm sorry to keep you inside uh, on a day that's actually in the 70s and sunny outside. So hopefully we'll be finished in time for you to get out and enjoy some of the sun uh, and, and still come away with the information that you need about uh, what's new and notable for 2022 for the MCAS Alt. Uh, so this is a training that we run uh, every year uh, for those teachers who are returning from having done the portfolios the previous year. So we wanna make sure that, uh, that you're in the right place. And we'll talk with you in a moment about the other trainings that are available this fall. Um, we wanna let you know that you've been um, muted and you're off camera to avoid distractions to me, who is very distractible. Uh, but if you do have questions as we go, um, here are the ground rules. Uh, if you have questions about a topic we have not yet discussed, please hold on to them. Don't ask the questions for something that might be answered in a slide or two ahead. Um, after that, uh, that topic is presented, then you can ask your questions. And uh, we have a group of folks, uh, among them Deborah Hand, our MCAS all coordinator, and some of our teacher consultants, We'll be happy to answer your questions. Uh, but again, let's observe uh, common sense rules here would be that you kind of listen to the presentation. And then if you have questions about that topic, uh, then you can ask them. And the way you answer a question is you hover your mouse above the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. And you can type in your question and we'll respond uh, as soon as we're able to get to it. We'll also be sending out a Q&A summary at the end of these three what's new presentations. Today is the second of three. Uh, the third one is next week. And also if you have questions about specific circumstances or a unique student or a situation uh, that involves, the, uh, that starts with the words, I have a student who, or uh, what do I do in this case or that case, then you can please um, reach out to us at the mailbox or phone number below and we'll be happy to discuss your issues with you uh, offline and privately and uh, solve your problems, hopefully, so that you know which way to head. Uh, so thanks for joining us again. And uh, wanted to let you know what other presentations we'd be having this fall. So if you could advance the slide, Kevin. You're in the right place if you've done the portfolio um, since 2019 or later. And if you haven't done a portfolio since 2019, uh, we'd suggest that you go to one of the introduction to MCAS all sessions. Uh, there's a schedule of these. They're in three parts. We want to make sure that you uh, get all the information you need. These, these presentations have become quite lengthy, so we do them in little chunks now. Uh, there's a schedule that links on this, um, on this particular slide. And incidentally, you were sent the link to these slides when we sent you the link to the presenta presentation. So, uh, if you got that uh, message about how to log on, which you obviously did, um, you can link to the slides and download them if you wish. And um, hopefully you'll, you'll uh, get the information you need in writing with all the live links here. Uh, our update is gonna be presented, as I mentioned, uh, three times this fall, the 5th, the 7th, and the 14th, summer morning, summer afternoon. Uh, we also are doing presentations on the competency and grade level portfolios. And these are for students uh, with significant disabilities that disable them or provide a barrier to their participation in the standard MCAS tests, but they're working at or close to grade level. And so those presentations on, are on October 18th and 20th. And then finally, uh, presentations for administrators and supervisors called the Administrator's Overview of MCAS and MCAS All for Students with Disabilities, which is a treetops view of uh, the assessment program as it pertains to students with disabilities. Um, we'll be talking about uh, the MCAS All, obviously, and also discussing ways in which those administrators and supervisors can support your work, which we know is time consuming. We, re we recognize that, uh, but we want to make sure you get the appropriate support. So. If you would like your administrator to attend that particular session, uh, you can uh, have them have them register for, register for that uh, on the site that was in our um, 
our flyer that was sent out to schools and is posted on the MCAS vault website. So here's what we're going to be doing today, um, a big overview here, not, not necessarily in this order, but we're going to be talking about our, our status, where we are now, where we've been, uh, where we're hopefully going this year if things stay as they are. Uh, we're in particularly challenging times, there's no question that we are, um, we are going through something that no one has ever experienced before, and we acknowledge the difficulties and challenges that you're facing not only in instruction, but also in conducting the MCAS all through your students. So we're going to recognize and acknowledge that and uh, give you some strategies and tips for moving ahead. Uh, we'll talk about how the portfolios looked last year. We did a scoring institute. It was a little bit later. It was over the summer, which is why our results are a little delayed getting back to you. You should be just receiving your parent guardian reports now for MCAS and MCAS all at the district central office. Uh, and and uh, shortly, copies of those will be sent to parents and you'll be receiving those in your school. The portfolios will be coming back to you in later, later in October. Uh, we'll discuss what's new and notable, things to remind you of for 2022 for the MCAS SALT. We have a, a section devoted uh, specifically to science and technology engineering. There's some changes to the assessment this year that we think you're going to like and we want to spend uh, the appropriate amount of time uh, reviewing that with you. Uh, we're going to remind you about the MCAS Vault Skills Survey, which is a required component of the MCAS Vault. It's fairly new. It was um, started in 2019, but uh, uh, you know we want to make sure that everyone knows how to do it and the fact that it is required. And a little bit about interpreting MCAS Vault scores, and we'll leave you with some resources and contact information so that you can get answers to questions after you leave here today. So that's our plan for you this, this afternoon. Obviously last year was uh, a crazy year. It was just so ridiculously challenging. Uh, I don't know where to begin here. Uh, schools that were teaching remotely. Some of them were open for some kids, but not all kids and some kids participated and some didn't. It was especially difficult for teachers who were uh, compiling evidence for the portfolio remotely. We designed a few learning materials for teachers to collect digital evidence via screenshots and uh, digital, uh, digital work samples, scanned work samples and so on using Google or whatever that might be, Google Docs. Uh, we also had a guide for parents that was um, a bit of guidance to show parents how to record particularly independence when they were uh, helping students with assignments and how to do that appropriately. Uh, last year, we also extended the deadline from April 1st to May 20th, which is very fortuitous because most schools reopened in um, sometime between early May, early April and early May. And so you did have a little bit of time uh, right before the portfolios were due to get at least some work together if you hadn't been able to do it previously. Uh, so we, we know that this was a very trying year for you. You did the best you could. We're proud of the work that you were able to do. Uh, we scored what we received. We couldn't really infer anything other than what we received, uh, but something is better than nothing and uh, do the best you can has always been our mantra. We talked about returning portfolios in late October. Um, we remind you to keep those portfolios securely under uh, lock and key at the school or the program. You can remove the contents from the binder if you wish, uh, but we do need to hold on to these portfolios. And there's a section in the educator's manual that talks about how long you're required to keep this, uh, these materials and this information at the school or your program. So we're hoping crossing our fingers, hoping that the assessments and the school year goes as planned. We still are uh, on track to, uh, to assess English language arts and mathematics in grades three through eight, science and technology engineering in grades five, eight, and either nine or 10. And of course, uh, in high school, we are um, assessing ELA mathematics. And if you haven't done it in grade nine, also science and technology engineering. Uh, we remind you too that this, uh, the evidence in the portfolio needs to be collected during this school year. 
please don't use evidence or data charts from last school year or from 2020 or from 2019. We really need to know where your students are right now, uh, this particular school year. Uh, with one exception, obviously, science evidence can be collected from uh, this school year and the immediately previous school year, uh, uh, the school year of uh, 2021. Um, there may be students in grade 11 or 12 who may not have participated in MCAS SALT at all in high school. And we want to just mention to you that there are uh, real ben benefits to having them participate at least once in high school in the MCAS SALT. We know it's additional work for you, but um, it may be the case that a parent might get upset that their students were never assessed in high school uh, on standards that could have led to the receipt of a high school diploma. And they probably would uh, have a leg to stand on if they uh, made, a, made a, bit, a bit of a ruckus about that. So we think it's good coverage to assess a student at least once in high school on the MCAS or the MCAS fault. We want to let you know that again this year, there'll be no accountability reporting for 2021 in case you were worried or interested in that. Uh, accountability with a big A, a large capital A. That means that we're not going to be uh, giving schools a level or a rank or a, um, a score for the assessment results. Uh, we are just going to report the results as we saw them. Um, the public has a right to know what those results were, the participation rates, the achievement levels, and for MCAS, the student growth uh, percentiles. Uh, but we will not be using that information uh, to compile any sort of uh, standing for your school in 2021. Let's talk about last year's results. Let's see what we, we found in the portfolios. Uh, not surprisingly, you'll see that uh, the number was down. The number of participants was about 1,200 students fewer in 2021 than it was two years ago in 2019. You'll remember that in 2020, the assessment was canceled. So we're looking back at 2019 here, and we see that there are many fewer students who submitted a portfolio with at least one strand in it. Uh, about a thousand fewer students submitted English language arts, mathematics, and in science, probably um, about 350 students fewer uh, submitted those portfolios, but about a thousand fewer in ELA and math. And uh, that totals about 1.3% of all students who participated in MCAS. And that's a number that we look at fairly uh, closely and carefully because we like to see that the number is going down a little bit each year uh, because of the requirements of the federal government and the Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA, which requires states to maintain a cap of 1% of students who take the MCAS vault. So we work with districts that have high numbers. We make sure they understand they need to look at students who might be able to participate in the test because uh, we want those students to be able to at least demonstrate partial movement toward the required standard to earn a diploma, which you cannot do on the MCAT SOL. So we just want to drive that home. We conducted training last year for about 3,000 participants. That's down about 1,000 from 2020. Uh, we hope to improve that number this year. Uh, we're going to tell you that most of these trainings will be virtual. But the circumstances in which we find ourselves may change over time. You've seen how rapidly things escalate and de-escalate uh, uh, regarding the, the COVID situation, the pandemic, um, and the numbers could go way down, in which case we might decide to have some, some hybrid trainings in which we do virtual training and then also uh, some in-person training for the portfolios in progress. So stay tuned for that. We'll let you know as we get closer whether those portfolios and progress trainings will be uh, virtual or in-person or only virtual or whatever, we'll, we'll keep you posted. It looks like January portfolios and progress right now will be only virtual. And so um, be, be aware of that. When we uh, aggregate all of the content areas for all of the grades together, we see a kind of a composite trend from 2017 that uh, this past year, in any case, led to an increase in the number of incomplete portfolios, 
an increase in the awareness and emerging portfolios and a decrease in the number of progressing portfolios. And this is a trend that um, we fully expected to see. Uh, the way we score and the way we uh, aggregate the sub scores together to come up with an overall score led us to assume that this would be the case. Uh, let's look at each, uh, each content area quickly. And we'll show you first English language arts. You can see that the number of, of uh, incompletes uh, more than doubled. You see that the number of emerging went up about five percentage points. The number of progressing went down about 11 percentage points, maybe 12. Um, this is due to several factors that we'll discuss with you in just a few moments. Uh, for mathematics, we see that the number of progressing portfolios went down a little bit less. It only went down about eight percentage points, but the number of incompletes is still fairly high. And we want to make sure that uh, everyone is aware of the reasons why those incomplete scores were given and what can be done to bring that number down next year. A lot of this will be taken care of by uh, just having uh, sufficient time to work with our students and produce portfolios a little more carefully and thoughtfully. Uh, not to say that you aren't uh, diligent and careful in, in the work you did last year, but um, obviously time was crunched and we had a lot of challenging circumstances uh, to put these together. So. Uh, and then finally, for science, we'll look at the same thing. We see uh, a doubling of the number of incompletes and about, um, looks like about 13 percentage points fewer for progressing. And so we'll, we'll speak with you now about what are some of the things we found in those portfolios as we looked through them last summer when we were scoring these. Uh, so here are some of the reasons why we discovered um, uh, portfolios were receiving scores of M which means missing or insufficient evidence in this strand uh, to yield a score. And uh, some are, again, some are quick fixes and some may require just a, a little more careful consideration and cross-checking before they're submitted. Uh, but we wanna make sure in the end that we see that the measurable outcome is addressed on the required numbers of dates, at least eight. And there are two pieces of primary evidence. That's those are sort of basic requirements uh, for most of the strands, at least English language arts and mathematics. Uh, and, and those are just the very minimum requirements that we need to see. Uh, we also see that um, in English language arts for reading in particular, uh, there was a pr pretty significant number of strands that just didn't include uh, the texts or the excerpts of texts that were used as the basis for the assessment. And again, that's a fairly quick fix. We just have to make a note, a mental note to ourselves to, um, to include the title of the, uh, the text that we're using as the basis so that we can tell whether literary or informational text was used. This isn't a frivolous request. This is so that we can know that, the, um, that you recognize and that we recognize that the informational and literary texts are separate topics, separate areas of the English language arts uh, framework. And they're very different from one, the other, one to the other and they can't be included, they can't be combined. So we wanna know that the titles are indicative of one or the other of those particular types of text. Um, we also expected that we would see um, several absent skill surveys. They weren't included for, it looks like about a thousand strands with the majority for whatever reason in the ELA writing strand. We wanna also make sure that you are aware uh, that the skill survey is required for every strand in English language arts and mathematics, and once in the entire science and tech engineering content area. We also saw that there were uh, at least one, perhaps more of the required ELA writing samples missing. And when, when writing is uh, scored M, that generally leads to a score of emerging, not incomplete, because we have two other strands on which to base the score. So this is one reason why we saw this, the number of emerging scores in English language arts uh, go up so much higher because one of the strands was uh, missing and the other two were okay. So that's what we needed to just uh, share with you. For science, uh, which is a fairly new requirement, I think last year might've been the first actual assessment where we uh, counted, scored and reported the results. We had asked you to submit six science and tech engineering summary sheets, and we did not see six of those. Um, 
And in some cases, the summary sheets didn't list the percentage of accuracy or, or independence. And we couldn't determine what that would be. If we can determine it, we will determine it. We, we will calculate it ourselves. But in many cases, we just can't do that because we weren't in the, in the room with you while this was happening. I said this above, but the strands in some subjects didn't include two pieces of primary evidence. Uh, so again, that was 407 strands and, and the data charts were missing in almost 400 of these strands in ELA and mathematics. So these are quick fixes. We think that given sufficient time, you'll be able to rectify in the future. So again, we appreciate all the hard work you did on these portfolios. We, we scored whatever we could score. Uh, we didn't score what we could not score. And uh, you did uh, incredible work last year under very challenging circumstances. Next slide, Kevin. Here's where we'll talk about what's coming up this particular year. There are a few changes, but mostly things are fairly similar to last year. Uh, we'll go through these one at a time now. Um, just to be aware, go back, yeah, thank you. Uh, just to be aware that in the MCAS All Educators Manual, which we update every year, it doesn't change that much, but in particular, we wanna draw your attention to the early part of the manual, pages three and four this year, which include a bulleted list of all of the changes and all of the reminders that we think are important enough to single out for you from the rest of the manual. Now, the rest of the manual is, uh, you know, it's about 60 pages and then plus all the forms you, you will, you'll need to use uh, for the portfolio. But um, uh, in those pages uh, followed, you know, guided by a table of contents, you can find the details of what you need. But the summary of the changes are on pages three and four. So we want to make sure that you know that, that you go ahead and look at that um, in case you can't remember what I said or don't have the slides in front of you. Uh, one of the things we mentioned in that summary is that uh, portfolios are going to be due uh, again on Friday, April 1st, 2022, which is the same date. That was the original submission date in 2021. It was pushed back to May 20th, but April 1st, 2022 is the due date uh, to, for portfolios to be shipped from your school. They can be shipped sooner than that if you wish, uh, but that's the absolute deadline, 5 p.m. April 1st, 2022. We also update the resource guides to the mass curriculum frameworks for students with disabilities in three subjects, ELA, mathematics, and science and tech engineering. There have been minor revisions to the introduction this year and also to the entry points based on some of our work with the content area specialists and also the suggestions that you've given us over the course of the year for entry points that you'd like to see added. We also sometimes uh, revise the access skills that are in these two. So let's point out here that uh, the MCAS Alt in grades five, eight, and high school biology and intro physics are all based on the latest version of the standards. The MCAS Alt for ELA and math is based on uh, the 2017 standards. The uh, intro, I'm sorry, the Grades five, eight, and biology and physics are based on the 2016 standards. Uh, the high school tech engineering and chemistry, however, are based on the earlier version of the standards, and they require the use of a separate uh, science and tech engineering resource guide. All of these resource guides, including the older science and tech engineering uh, for uh, tech engineering and chemistry, are all posted to the department's alternate assessment webpage. Uh, just for information, for the first time this year, uh, you may be interested to know that we are uh, finally administering next generation high school biology and introductory physics MCAS tests this year uh, for the first time. And that's uh, been a long time coming. We've planned these for two years now, uh, but between cancellations and interrupted instruction, we're now finally able to introduce these uh, next spring. Uh, so that's it for the changes uh, in, the, in the big picture, but I do wanna talk with you about some important changes for science and technology engineering. Uh, now, please uh, hold your questions on this until we've gone through the presentation on science and technology engineering. 
Uh, many of your questions will be asked as we go through this. There are a lot of complexities to this. And so I wanna make sure uh, we capture everything and summarize it for you before you go off on a tangent and ask questions that may be answered in the, in the coming slides. Uh, so hold on. Uh, this information is going to um, probably be good news for you. Uh, we we want to make sure that you know that the, the next generation science and tech engineering, that's grades five, eight, and high school biology and introductory physics, the strand requirements have been changed. We want to make sure that you know that now a total of only three rather than six entry points and summary sheets and core ideas are, are required. We had required uh, six entry points per core idea. It's now three. Uh, the same requirements um, remain for high school tech engine chemistry because they're uh, what we call legacy uh, disciplines. And so the core set of evidence of you know data chart with eight dates and two pieces of evidence is still in effect. But for high school biology and introductory physics, and grades five and eight, science and tech engineering, only three entry points per core idea are required rather than six. This is good news. This cuts your work in half. And after many suggestions from many people, including your colleagues who are our training specialists, uh, our teacher consultants, uh, this went all the way up to the Associate Commissioner of Assessment, uh, we decided to lower those requirements from six to three. Let's move on and talk a little bit more about this and see what this looks like. Um, the disciplines in the frameworks are the same as they were in the previous frameworks, just so you know. This is background information. Life science, physical science, earth and space science, and tech engineering are the grades five and eight disciplines that are assessed. In high school, the disciplines are the same as high school was previous to the 2016 standards. So that's biology, introductory physics, chemistry and technology engineering. And we do not still not assess earth and space science in high school. The terminology is a little different. Now topics, as they used to be called in the previous frameworks are now called core ideas. These are big areas within each discipline. And the introduction of the eight science practices has complicated our lives considerably, but we think it'll make for a more a cohesive unit of instruction. If you are um, assessing uh, science content, this content is actually embedded within a science practice. These practices promote engagement in inquiry and uh, engineering design skills. And we think if you look at the resource guide, which I'll show you in just a moment, uh, the content itself you'll see is embedded within those science practices. So let's look at the resource guide now and see what this looks like. Oh, well, we'll look, for it, look at it in the next slide. We're allowing you to now um, conduct a unit of instruction and to assess that as an entry point rather than a discrete isolated skill, which we had done before. We've been working on this challenge for several years, trying to get away from these uh, very singular, unique, isolated skills and into a more unit of instruction. Um, we want this unit, of course, to be coherent, as coherent as possible. Uh, so it should all be on the same kinds of activities, but using different practices. These, um, these units of instruction encourage the assessment of multiple entry points in a single strand. So this is a little bit of a departure from the requirements in English language arts and math. And these practices promote a range of instructional approaches to, to teach this core idea. So in the resource guide for science, uh, these entry points are and access skills as well are listed in grade spans. You'll see them listed below here, pre-K to two, three to five, six to eight, and nine to 12. And a reminder that no data charts are required for next generation science and tech engineering strands. Now we can look at the resource guide and see how this is laid out. It's a little bit different than the ELA and math where the entry points are laid out in, in order from less complex to more complex. In this case, they're laid out with the core idea in the left-hand margin. In this case, earth and human activity, that's the core idea. And then the science practices are numbered. There are eight science practices. I've shown you three of them here. 
practice one, three, and five at the top of the slide. Um, and then within each, uh, beneath each practice are these bulleted entry points in which the practice is used to make some kind of sense of the topic of earth and human activity. So we see analyzing and interpreting data. Well, one of the entry points is analyze and interpret data to make sense of the rise in global temperatures or to compare data showing the increase of human population or evaluate and refine design solutions, whatever it might be. All of those entry points relate to the practice of analyzing and interpreting data. So for each core idea, we're gonna ask you to use three of these, three different science practices Choose the entry point you wish to use, and that can be your science strand. The evidence from your activity in that particular entry point serves as the, the uh, contents of the portfolio. So let's move ahead and talk about the steps here. It's a little different for high school than it is for grades five and eight. So let's talk about five and eight first. You'll choose any three of the four disciplines that are allowed for assessment in grades five through eight, five and eight. You'll choose your discipline. And then in high school, you choose either biology or intro physics. And then you need to conduct the science and tech engineering skills survey. There's a link to this thing, which is a downloadable paper format. Or uh, if you wish, it's part of your online forms and graphs program, which prompts you to remember to do this. And so, uh, the idea is that you're determining the grade span at which you will then go ahead to select entry points for the student. So the uh, skill survey, we'll talk more about this in the future, but uh, in, in a couple of a couple more slides, but the skill survey for science needs to be conducted once for the entire discipline in all eight science practices, not in each discipline. For English language arts and math, the skill survey is conducted for each strand. For science, it's conducted once in the entire discipline, but in all the science practices. So in each selected discipline, you select your core idea, which is the, again, the topic that will challenge and engage the student and for which you have your instructional plans and ideas. Uh, you'll review the entry points or the access skills found uh, in each core idea beneath each practice. And hopefully you'll be, you'll be able to um, Put, pull together a cohesive unit using three different science practices and entry points that relate to the core idea. So for each core idea, you're selecting three entry points or access skills that each employs a different science practice. So if you wanna see that you've used three science practices for each core idea. So if the entry points seem too complex or challenging at the grade level of the student, it's okay to select entry points from earlier grade levels in the same core idea. And that's where the results of the skill survey can help you determine which uh, entry points might be a good place to start with the student based on what they were able to do in your informal assessment on the skill survey. You'll need to complete one science and tech engineering summary sheet for each of the three selected entry points or access skills in that core idea and include the following information on that summary sheet. You'll see a list here of what that summary sheet prompts you to add to that, that, uh, that sheet. I'll show you what the sheet looks like in uh, just a moment. And all of the activities on each of these summary sheets needs to document the entry point that you selected for the student or, or access skill. And then finally, you attach each piece of the primary evidence, which may be a work sample, a photograph, or digital evidence to its completed science and tech engineering summary sheet for a total of three. Three summary sheets, three pieces of primary evidence, three entry points, it's the rule of threes. And then you might uh, want to attach any examples of self-evaluation if they exist. Um, if the evidence is difficult or impossible to, to attach, it's too big, it's too uh, breakable, it's, it's uh, fragile, uh, you can take a, you know, you can take a picture of that. You can substitute a clearly labeled photograph for anything that's too large, fragile, or temporary and cannot fit in a portfolio. 
So then you complete at the end of those three uh, summary sheets and three sets of activities for three entry points, you're gonna complete an overall, an overarching strand cover sheet for science. It's a special uh, science and tech engineering strand cover sheet for each of the core idea. So we know, and the scorers know what we're about to look at when we score this particular strand of your science portfolios. So here's what a summary sheet looks like. Uh, there's room at the top for the student's name, date, grade, discipline, the core idea, and the number of the science practice. Remember, there are eight of them. And you just put the number here. And then whether it's an entry point or access skill, and in the box next to that checkbox, you list the entry point or access skill right in that box. The uh, forms and graphs online prompts you to do this, and you can just click on it and it exports right into that box. Then there's room for self-evaluation. At the bottom of uh, the description of activity, we want you to describe the activity you did with your students. This is in your words. We need to see what, what you say about what you asked the student to do and how they responded, uh, the way in which they responded and uh, how the activity was conducted. And at the very bottom, there is room for summarizing the student's percentage of accuracy and independence on the responses on the attached work sample. We think this will be much more workable and much more streamlined for you than last year's requirements of six summary sheets and six examples. Um, we think we can get the same level of, uh, of information on your students' performance with three as we could with six. So um, looking forward to seeing how you do with this. Um, we think it'll be much, much more simple and less challenging for everyone. This is the strand cover sheet, which sits on top of the three summary sheets and work samples. Uh, this is something in, uh, under which we wanna make sure you're including uh, the three summary sheets, the three that include three different science practices. So you'll see that listed in the lower left-hand corner of the sheet, the numbers of the three practices you used, uh, that, the, that you've attached three pieces of evidence, uh, and the date, the description, and whether self-evaluation was included in that particular, uh, those particular activities. Let's see what comes next here. I wanted to show you some samples. This is a strand that we just put together, wanted you to see some examples of activities in which um, I believe um, teachers may have been stretched a little bit in determining these activities, but in the end, they were extremely engaging for kids. They involved a lot of hands-on activities, and it appears that the students really enjoyed doing them. Uh, so in this one, this is evidence number one. I'm gonna show you three of these. Uh, this is evidence number one that's about design solutions, and that's practice number six. Um, I'm going to read to you the, uh, the activity description at the top. The student is matching the labels to show how your design uses wind power to lift washers. And the student is, uh, we're, let, let's look at the right-hand side before we look at how the student performed this. The entry point is draw and or explain a design solution. And that's what I've circled in red here. And the description is that the student labeled the parts of a windmill using a photograph of its completed project and printed words to match the parts. Okay, so let's go back to the sample. And we have five, uh, five labels that the student attached to this that said the wind blows, the blades turn, it turns the stick, which he calls the axis, axis or al axle, I can't quite see it. Uh, it twists the string, and it lifts the cup. And so in this way, uh, the student performed this using, uh, using this model, but also uh, this is uh, his, his example of a design solution. Uh, let's look at evidence two for the same activity, right? This is a cohesive unit. So they're using uh, all their activities are circuit, uh, circling around this, this one activity. He's now analyzing the data from this activity uh, on the summary sheet, his entry point is draw conclusions based on evidence, for example, from an investigation about the validity of a design solution. So he's analyzing and interpreting data. That's the practice, it's practice number three. Teacher says, after planning and building a model windmill, student completed a reflections worksheet that included the data from testing his windmill. 
He recorded changes that he made from the original design and a teacher scribed his responses. So we can see on the left that the student is, um, you know, but what, did, what happened? Was, this, was the windmill able to lift any washers? He says, yes, even though it was a cup, the, the question was washers. Uh, how many washers was your windmill able to lift? One. In your opinion, was the hardest part of this engineering project? Or what was the hardest part? And he said, making the blades. What changes did you have to make along the way to your windmill? Added the cup, added sticks to the blades, folded the blades. And so this is, again, practice number two, another sample related to the activity of using the windmill to lift uh, a weighted object. And then finally, number three, which is his ability to use scientific evidence to support a claim about the solution that best fits the needs of a problem. And the practice is number seven, engaging in argument from evidence. And so he is simply discussing uh, whether, his, whether he agrees with the claim that's on the piece of work, can the wind power be used to lift objects up and down? He says yes, and he needs to provide some kind of reason why that's an argument a claim he makes a claim an argument is the reason why and he says the blade moves that's sort of a decent exp ex explanation but not entirely accurate and so you can see on the uh, summary sheet that she uh, scored this student as accuracy 50 percent but he did it completely independently so that's 100 percent so this is a good example of a cohesive unit in which practices, three different practices are used to gather evidence on a uh, finding a design solution to lifting uh, weighted objects off the table using wind power. I'm going to show you a few more random samples of science just so you get the idea here. Uh, the evidence here is a, uh, a picture actually that the student pasted together of a flower. He calls it a plant functional model. And remember that models can be two-dimensional or three-dimensional. It doesn't have to be something you build. It can be something on paper. It can be a drawing, a painting, a collage, whatever it might be. And the student's um, uh, entry point here is to illustrate, construct, and label or label a model to show or explain the functions of the observable parts of a plant. And so the description where student looked at a model and then completed a worksheet after investigation of living plants. He included the functions for all the parts of the plants, including the roots. And you can see where the student glued this thing together and then glued on the labels. And he did it 100% accurate and 100% independently. Let's look at one more. I'm sorry, this is uh, back one second. I'm sorry, Kevin. Uh, this is the uh, science practice for developing and using models. OK. This is a, uh, a piece of evidence that uses the practice asking questions or defining problems. Now, we're not just asking questions here. We're asking relevant scientific questions. And that's an important distinction here. Uh, so the student is recording relevant questions about forces, pushes and pulls that act upon an object based on observations. And so there's a series of questions here that the uh, instructions are to record three relevant questions about forces that act upon an object based on observation. So these are things uh, the teacher is asking the student what he wants to know about forces, about pushes and pulls on an object. Why do some, some things that are moving stay moving? Uh, what, are type, what types of things are forces? Um, what, what does inertia mean? teacher scribe beneath the student's handwriting because it wasn't entirely clear what he was saying. So these are relevant questions, certainly. She scored this uh, uh, three out of three accurate and 100% independent. And you can see at the bottom that she inserted those percentages. Now let's see, let's look at one more. This one happens to be a photograph of a model of a water cycle. Uh, the practice is developing and using a model, again, uh, but this is something that could not fit in the portfolio for which they included a photograph. So the entry point is illustrating or developing a model to show or explain the water cycle pretty clearly here. Uh, the description is that uh, the student created a diorama to depict a water cycle and labeled each part of the process. And they also included the percent of accuracy and independence at the bottom. 
uh, in terms of the labels that the student put on this and how well they, they put together uh, this particular model. So uh, these are all examples of perfectly valid, scorable, wonderful science activities that, uh, that you can use in your, in your uh, science assessment. Uh, just a note about photographs. Uh, that they nearly that they clearly need to show the end product of instruction. Um, they can't be blurry or too far away or slanted at an angle. We need to see what it is is being portrayed in the picture. We don't need to see the student um, doing the activity. In fact, you'd need a photo release if you were going to include that. Uh, but we do need to clear, see this clear end product. You can also include a sequence of steps leading up to the final product. That would maybe be helpful though the end product is the one that's scorable. And then the, again, the accuracy and independence needs to be depicted somewhere, either on the summary sheet or on the sample itself. Okay, let's move on to a couple of the other subject areas that uh, require some reminders, we think. Uh, we wanted to remind you that for writing, uh, there's only one entry point for writing, and it's gonna look like this. Uh, use the student's primary mode of communication to express or create a writing sample that's either an opinion or an argument, a narrative, and that includes poetry, or an informative or explanatory text. These are the three kinds of writing that we score, actually four if you count poetry. And the emphasis in our scoring is always on what did the student do? We're looking for the independent work of the student using their primary mode of communication. Uh, teachers often uh, tend to maybe edit or rewrite or redo the work of the student. We want to make sure that we're seeing the voice of the student in this particular work. Uh, a reminder that each of these writing samples need to be on a different topic. We're looking for three writing samples and one baseline. The baseline can be related to one of the finding sample, final samples or not but we need to see the final writing sample and we need teachers to pre-score that each sample using our, pre uh, our ELA writing scoring rubric uh, and to submit those scores with the work. Uh, we wanna remind you that writing samples can be either in writing or word process printouts. They can be screenshots of a writing sample or a photograph of a writing sample. They can be digital, in other words, PDF, Word, PowerPoint, any of the ways in which students may produce work, a printout from Google Docs is fine, as long as we can read it. Uh, and also it's fine to scribe a work sample for a student if the student normally participates in written activities that way, and it's the only way uh, that they can participate. For reading, we've talked about the need to include titles of the text, but I wanted to expand your uh, your awareness of some available texts that have been adapted for students at different levels. And to point you in the direction of the Sherlock Center at Rhode Island College, which is an extraordinary resource that provides uh, both literary and some informational texts in adapted formats. And you can see uh, on the right here, there is a, um, an adaptation of the diary of Anne Frank, which is of course a literary text in which uh, pictures and words are used. Uh, this is a symbol system, obviously, uh, used to tell the story of Anne Frank. And then at the bottom of this slide, uh, a number of science informational texts are available, in, coincidentally, in the disciplines that we are uh, asking you to consider for assessment. And so, uh, the, again, the uh, URL is provided in the chat, which Deb just put in there but also uh, provided on this screen. If you download these slides, this link in the middle of the slide is, is live, so you can click on it and get right to it. Uh, this, it's a wonderful resource, and um, just wanted to make sure you were aware of it because we want to make sure that you're not assessing students on uh, below grade level text, but that they're working on similar texts to their, their, uh, their peers. And if you adapt a similar text to a, what a peer in that grade is working on, that's different than working on uh, texts that may have been uh, lowered in appropriateness. We don't want age inappropriate text to be used if it's avoidable. Okay. So I'm gonna take a breath. I'm gonna ask Kevin Froten from Cognia, who's been our uh, 
a contact and um, logistical coordinator and liaison from, from our contractor to uh, take a moment and share with you uh, how to access our password protected application for you guys to complete all the MCASL required forms, the data charts, the skills survey, et cetera, um, and which can be accessed either through our website at the department or directly uh, through the Cognia website which I guess is still called Measure Progress, right, Kevin? It is for now, yeah. Okay, and there's a support <laughs> line if you need help doing this, but I'm gonna ask Kevin to show, show you uh, what this thing looks like as a reminder, but also point to you, uh, point out some changes that have been made this year. So take it away, Kevin. Thank you, Dan. So one second while I just shift gears here and, and get it up and running. Um, so you're all, um, returning teachers with experience with ALT, so likely you've, you've used this um, in previous years. Um, so the basic look and feel hasn't changed too much, I'm still in the same location. So if you have it bookmarked, it'll come right up. It's been live for a couple of weeks now. Um, point out right from the, the get-go that um, as we always do, nothing's carried over from year to year. So we don't bring your students forward. You need to put them in here for the uh, year uh, school year that they're currently in and grade. Um, and along with that, your account also um, gets wiped along the way. So first step is always just make sure you go to the registration page and give it the two pieces of information it wants, an email address to act as your username and choose your own password and you're, you're off and running uh, for this year. I've got a little sample going, so I'm just going to log in. I point out um, you don't have to do this. It will always cycle you to this page, this My Account page. It's all blank. Again, it knows nothing about you, your students. It doesn't carry anything from school databases or SIMS. It's a completely open-ended system. You populate um, who you want in it and what you want that information to be. Um, so this My Account page, you don't have to do it, um, but particularly if you have multiple students, I like to remind people that anything you put here, it'll automatically do for you on all of the portfolio cover sheets. So you don't have to keep typing this information again and again. You can do it once and, and be done with it. Um, what nobody does is ever screw it down on this page. Um, and normally you don't need to, except when you accidentally delete a student. And people love to accidentally delete a student right at the very end um, when they're getting things ready um, to submit at the end of the year. Um, very stressful. You think everything's gone. We're not that cruel. We don't just burn everything you did for an entire year. If you mosey on down to the bottom of this, you'll notice that hanging out here are deleted students. Um, we don't really delete anything. We're just sort of hiding it from you in your active student list. So one little click and boom, it's all back like you never did it. So if, if you do find yourself of deleting a student you didn't mean to, just know my account go right to the bottom and restore that student back. I will say that works for kind of, we just sort of hide the student. If you delete a strand, it does kind of destroy as it goes. So we can't restore a strand as easily um, because it makes room for whatever the next strand you're going to put in for that student for that content area. So that one means it. Um, and it does prompt you to say, are you sure? Um, so don't, don't just click yes if you're not sure because it will just go away. So same as it ever was for most of this. Um, when you go into your My Student list, the first time in, again, it doesn't carry anything over, so it will be blank. You can just start adding students in, click Add a Student, and um, build them all out. Um, I'll show you a sample I have, just to remind you of the basics of where to go and what to do, and then highlight some changes that we put in place for this year. So once you have a student in here, go to Portfolio. Um, the first time you load a student, it's going to take you to the portfolio cover sheet. Um, so student name, it'll have the generic new student in there, give it them an actual name, SACID. And again, SACID is always that 10 digit number beginning with, so remember 10 digits begins with 10, one zero. Um, sometimes we have district IDs or things in there. So we're looking for that SIMS state official SACID with that, that 10 digit number. Um, and notice, even if I hadn't already had this existed, this would all be done for me. My school, uh, my codes, my addresses, my name, the anything it knows at this point, it would have put in there for me. But where you go most of the time, so once you get past that portfolio cover sheet, is normally you'll load right into table of contents. And the two big ones um, are the skill survey and the strand list. And they're kind of linked in a way. It won't let you create a, a full-on strand until you've done the skill survey completely for that strand. Um, 
So I'll show you the, the wrong way to do it first and then show you what it's looking for um, if you've been, been caught by kind of not letting you build out a strand in the past. So go to the strand cover sheet list. I've got some samples going, um, but one thing I've changed for this year is when you add a new strand, it also sorts by content area now, which normally was what you did them in, and now it'll put ELA math and science on top of each other. It's a little easier to, to get to. Uh, bothered me for years, and I finally made it sort the way that it kind of makes sense of the content areas. But when you add a new strand, it used to be, um, and you high school folks will know <laughs> more than the others, uh, it was a big long list of all the content areas. At high school, there was like 20 selections that you had to look through. It was a really long list of radio buttons. Uh, now it's just grouped by content area. So you have one more step, but it's much cleaner to get at what you want. So if you want ELA, okay, there's just the ELA for that grade. Math, this is a grade five, boom, there are the math. And then science, if you're five, eight or high school, you get just the science. So a lot cleaner than the big long list of, of just looking at everything. Also kind of tuck this down here. Um, I, this was at the top for years and years. Um, not really an alt thing. It is and it isn't. Th these are intended, um, sometimes people see grade level and they think, yeah, he's a grade five. This is intended for those competency and grade level portfolio. So not the alt, they're completely different things. Um, so if you are at that, what that does is it just toggles on the other available strands that you submit for that at grade level. The cover sheets are different, the labels are different, everything's different about it. So it um, still needs to be here, but I just hit it down here so you don't do it by accident. Because once you select it, you're locked in, and the only way back is to delete it. So 99% of you don't ever click this. So um, don't worry about it if you're not doing competency or grade level portfolios. Um, so now I'll show you that link between the strand and the skill survey. Um, some of you might have found this <laughs> the hard way of trying to do one before the other, but if I try to do a strand, so let's do number and operations base 10, it's not going to let me. It's going to tell me you need to do the skill survey before you complete that strand. You can go back to the table of contents and select the skill survey list, but you can hop right into it clicking go to skill survey. Um, I've got a couple going. Um, I'll show you one. So if I did that math one, it would unlock it and, and let me proceed with that strand cover sheet. But what does catch people sometimes um, is they, they think they did it all. Um, but with these for ELA um, and math, science is a little bit different. I'll touch on that in a second. Every single line, so in this case, one through 10, some have fewer, some have more, needs a response. So something in A, B, C, or D, or E. Um, everything needs to be checked off. And if you skip over five um, and then just go to the end, it will not unlock that strand. You have to come back and take a look and, and make sure you, you have a selection um, in each of these. So that catches people sometimes. They, they think they did the complete skill survey, but they just missed one of the lines in there. And until you do it from top to bottom, it will not let you get into that strand cover sheet. So I'm going to go back to my table of contents and just um, show you that language strand really quick. Nothing's really changed here. Um, we've got a, a basic kind of work description labels, bar graphs, um, the math and language and reading really haven't changed. It's the same as it ever was of, of selecting your learning standard, getting your uh, measurable outcome. Um, what has tweaked a little bit are, uh, let me get back to my strand list. So for writing, this one's changed slightly. The content's still the same, but just a new kind of um, accessibility of forms features in here. So the basic layout's the same, select your learning standard, choose an entry point or access skills. And just pointing out, Dan touched on this, I'll, I'll remind you here, cause it throws people sometimes, it's cause it's so different looking. When you click on find entry points, just remember it's that one generic entry point. So there's a whole bunch of access skills. So don't, don't be tempted by those if you are a student having a student that's access skills. Most of you will just use this one generic student's primary mode of communication along with the text type um, for the, the entry points. Um, this is blank by design. There, there shouldn't be entry points here. It's just that one. 
So the basic format of the, the writing strand remains the same, where you have a baseline. And again, no rubric with the baseline. It's just, just the, the sample, the, the evidence of the writing sample with the, the label. And then three a set of three of a final work description label with a rubric, final with a rubric, final with a rubric. No real change there whatsoever. Same forms that you've used for the past several years now. What has changed is a feature that was added last year for ELA, um, anything other than writing and math was the ability to generate multiple forms at once. Um, previously, you had to do open it up, print it, open it up and print it for all of the rubrics, all of the, the um, label description forms. So up here, where it used to just be print the strand cover sheet, you have print options like the other strands last year. And you can still just, if you just have a slight change to the strand cover sheet, you can print just that by itself. Um, but there is now this multiple um, form generating. So if I click show me multiple, we'll come back to this in a second, just ignore at the top here for now, but it gives me my strand cover sheet, grabs the skills survey for me now and shoves it right in, in here so you don't have to go back and do that separately. If you completed it um, before, uh, it'll populate it right for you in there. Then I have my baseline, final, final, final. So I get all my forms um, right here. Um, but what about the rubrics? Uh, so that happens at the top, just like the others where you generate your data chart separately from everything else it's doing. Um, it's going to do that with the rubrics as well. So click to print rubrics. Uh, OK. And boom. So I've got my first rubric, my second, and my third. So I get them all. Um, in one shot. In two clicks now, you can get to everything rather than eight or nine um, that you had previously. So hopefully a, a little more streamlined for you. And a similar thing in science. So if we go to the table of contents, pop into a science strand. I've got a life science one going here. They all work the same for the next generation. Core idea, learning standard, that's all the same, um, no real change here. And even down below, it's still the same, but the requirements have changed. Used to have to have six in this grid to be complete. Now it's just three. So just keep that in mind, three, three, three um, is, is the key for science. So three different summary sheets showing three different practices with three pieces of evidence all attached. So what you see here is the essence of what needs to be submitted for science and then um, however many self evals is appropriate um, that you can capture with your student. Um, and then the summary sheets themselves really haven't changed, except up top, exactly the same. When we get down to the bottom, back when it used to say, are you going to attach evidence, yes or no? And if no, it would give you that grid where you said expected response, the student's response, and the notes about that. That is no longer... Um, included because the intent is that evidence is attached for all three. Um, so always check that off. It's always going to be that evidence is attached. You don't have to fill out that, that the grid anymore for some that you are and some that you aren't. Um, always evidence attached for all three that you're doing. But when we pop back to the strand cover sheet, again, we've got print options. Last year it was one at a time. Now print options still can just do the strand cover by itself. And here we have the strand cover, my summary sheet one, summary sheet two, summary sheet three. So I get them all, they'll generate them on separate pages for you. But what about the skill survey? So the, the skill survey is included, um, but it's optional to include in this print um, because it's not required for every strand. You need one for the entire discipline of science for the student. Um, so you don't have to do it for life science and earth and space and physical, just one right at the start of your science and you're done. It's just the, the generic skills for the eight practices. So it's giving you the option. It says, do you want to include the skill survey to save you from having to go back to remember to get it from the skill survey list? It'll just toggle it here for you. If you, you wanna include it, you really only have to do this once, remember? So click print and it'll generate the skill survey that I completed from that skill survey list. And again, science completely different. It's a big long for all the eight practices before you had to select every single line. The key to completing the science skill survey is at least one of these for every practice type needs a check mark. This is just the print version. I can't interact with it, but you, you see that every single one 
has at least one check mark. And if all of these skills are too high, remember that this is always here well for, as well for each practice that my student cannot perform any of the, the skills in this science practice. Um, so maybe you use that, maybe you don't, and it can de totally depend on the practice type, um, but that's that's how you get to it, just one. Um, we did see some that people just kept putting it in on every strand and no harm in that, but it's it's more than you have to do. We just need to see it once in the portfolio and you are good to go with the skill survey. Um, so that's kind of a high level quick walkthrough um, and a reminder of, of how this all works. Um, it is live now, I said, you have the luxury of time. It's an open system. Feel free to put in like a sample student like I have, click around, delete it later. Um, it, that just to get your your back into the swing of things. Um, but it is available. Um, if you have any questions along the way, I'm always happy to, to have a chat, shoot me an email or the tech support line um, is, is great as well. Um, so now I'll kick it back over to Dan and get the PowerPoint back up and he'll um, walk you through the rest of what's new for the year. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, glad to see you've been so responsive to the requests from our teachers for things like the print all button and uh, just making this uh, every year a little bit easier to navigate. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that skill survey that you were mentioning, but just wanted to make sure you knew where to call for support. There's a number down below at the bottom of your screen and access to the online forms and graphs can be found at either of these two, uh, at either of these two links in your slide. We do want to talk with you about the skill survey and I believe that comes next. So let's, uh, Let's look at that. Okay, next slide. This is a requirement that we put in place a couple of years ago, but then there was these interrupted assessments and canceled assessments, and we never really got to use it, uh, or you ne never really got to use it with your students until last year. But it is a requirement for each strand of the ELA and math uh, MCAS salt. And again, once, as Kevin said, in the entire content area of science and tech engineering. And it's not as long as, and cumbersome as um, maybe you were led to believe. It's just something that has to be done for the student's current level of skills, not last year's, and not what you remember from 2019. But uh, today, this year, right now, when you're doing it, uh, we need to assess how well the student's able to do some of these, what we call critical skills in each uh, strand or subject area. So we're pre-testing the student on a range of skills this is range finding, as we call it in the test biz. And then we're going to be doing some pinpointing as we select entry points and do the actual assessment using the entry points. So we're asking you to uh, pre-test each of your students on a range of those skills informally, briefly, uh, but make sure you do it. And that uh, you select the entry points based on the results of that skill survey. Uh, we've heard from teachers that it is very helpful that they don't spend time rifling through the resource guide or the standards trying to figure out which one they want to do. They already have a good sense of what their student is capable of. So when you've conducted the skill survey, we want you to print it out, please, and include it in, uh, in the strand, just behind the strand cover sheet. And um, I wanted you to be aware that if it's missing, it does count as an M. It will not be able, we will not be able to score the strand. We take this very seriously and we want to make sure it's included. And so the, again, the reasons, some of the reasons we're doing this is to familiarize teachers with the full range of skills and standards and possible entry points and to help select challenging and appropriate entry points that are skills that the student does not already know how to do. So it discourages the selection of uh, skills that are too easy. And if you find that your student uh, can do them can do them all. It may be that uh, this may not be the appropriate assessment for them. They may be able to participate in the test. And if they can't do any of the skills, it may be that they will uh, maybe more appropriately be assessed on access skills rather than entry points. Uh, so these are some of the implications of doing the skills survey that I think in the in the long run uh, will help familiarize you with your students' abilities and also with the standards themselves. So thanks for helping us out with this. So each of these skill surveys includes a list of what we call critical skills in each strand and domain. It's not every single skill, 
but it's a, a list of skills that the number about 10, some are less, some are a little more, and they go from the um, easiest to more complex, to lowest to more com uh, lowest to greater complexity, starting with the easier ones. And we're asking um, teachers to briefly and informally assess your student on the skills before selecting entry points and to check column A, B, C, or D, or E for each of the skills. And the description of each of those columns is uh, ranges from the student can't perform the skill at all ever by themselves, or that they can perform the skill almost all of the time without support. So you decide which one, which description best fits uh, your student's ability to perform that particular skill. You can assess these students on this informal skill survey assessment based on uh, the examples that we provide you on the survey form. There are some several with examples included. You can design your own tasks. Uh, you should accommodate each student's instructional needs uh, when you do that. Um, and you can also use observations or your own informal assessments um, based on their recent classroom work. And the key here is recent. So then you're selecting the entry point for the strand based on, or maybe related to the skills that were checked in columns A, B, or C. Those are the columns for which we determine that the student has not yet learned the skill. Columns D and E signify that the student is already performing the skill at least some of the time independently. So if you need a little bit more explanation or detailed um, discussion of this, you can find it in our educator's manual on the pages listed at the bottom of the slide. This is what the mathematics skills survey in numbers in base 10 uh, mathematics looks like for grade five. Uh, you can see that there are students uh, who can do some uh, maybe more basic skills at the beginning, like counting to 10. And then by the time you get to skill number 12, they're dividing a three digit number by a one digit number. This is fairly com complex skills that we don't expect all or even many students to be able to master, but it's possible that they could do that. But you can see that the way in which this teacher um, filled up the columns, that there is a progression from the easier skills, which start in column E, to the more complicated and complex skills and difficult skills that now are in columns A, B, and C. And so you are, um, maybe you want to, um, determine which skills in columns A, B, or C you want to work with uh, the student on, on, your, on a more detailed assessment for the MCAS all. Okay, let's move on to science. Show you what this one looks like. Uh, Kevin briefly showed this to you, and he showed you that you can place an X uh, for each practice. This is analyzing and interpreting data. And you can draw an X in the box next to any skill that the student can perform independently at least some of the time, which we would say is occasionally. They can occasionally do this skill. And then this one goes only up to grades three through five. That's the highest level at which the student is able to perform any of these skills. And so we're saying that you should select entry points beginning at the highest grade span in which the checkbox appears. So you would start for this particular uh, science practice uh, for whatever topic you're, you're addressing, uh, beginning with grades three through five. We have no idea what grade the student is in, perhaps they're in grade five, perhaps, perhaps grade eight. But you would begin looking for entry points in grades three through five, because we think there are some skills there that the student may find challenging but attainable, and that would be the appropriate place to start. If you can't find entry points at grades three through five, you're certainly free to uh, spiral back to earlier grade levels and choose entry points from there. But we'd like you to select entry points at the highest grade level uh, that the student would find engaging. A quick interpretation of the feedback form that you're getting uh, probably in a couple of weeks, your portfolios are, gonna, are being packaged now for shipment back to your schools. Um, we wanted you to know that the feedback form, which you've seen, many of you have seen before, uh, lists the content area. It lists the, um, the uh, strand within each area. And then it gives you what are called subscores within each of those, uh, within each of those strands. 
And so these are all based on the rubric for scoring portfolio strands. Uh, they show the scores in each rubric area. Uh, they also show you the scorer comments, things the scorers felt they were important for you to know, and then an overall strand score for that particular subject, in this case, emerging. Um, be aware that the scorers' comments are not uh, individually tailored to your particular student's portfolio. They select these off a, a pick list, it's called, where they have a number of um, comments that we see frequently and we know need to be made frequently. And uh, they may not be exactly well suited to your particular situation, but we think they get to the gist of the issue here. And so if you have a, a problem understanding uh, what these mean, um, have patience with us and ask us your question offline and we'll, we'll talk with you about what they were trying to tell you. The next slide shows you the scoring rubric that we use to score these portfolios. Uh, the numerical scores on the feedback form are based on these uh, in the scoring rubric. You can see that um, uh, this has been the basis for scoring for several years. Uh, it includes the designation of M in case the in, uh, not sufficient information is included, insufficient information to determine a score as we call M. Uh, and then these quartiles of scores that are roughly divided by uh, 25 percentage points. So uh, 0 to 25 percent, 26 to 50 percent, 51 to 75, and 76 to 100 in these various uh, areas that are in the first column, like accuracy, independence, is self-evaluation included? Do we see examples of multiple, uh, uh, multiple examples of uh, different instructional approaches? And then the level of complexity across the top, which discusses uh, the relationship to the curriculum frameworks. If they are aligned with frameworks, did we see uh, access skills at level two entry for a score of three? And the four and the fives are for uh, portfolios of students who are working at grade level. The whole section on scoring and the educator's manual that we direct you to for uh, a better understanding of how we are scoring the portfolios but in any event, the uh, scores are reported in what we call alternate achievement levels. The alternate achievement levels are not the same as for regular MCATs. They're all for students who are working well below grade level, but we don't wanna call them warning or failing or not meeting expectations because in most cases, we know that they're not working at grade level, but they want to reward students for where they are and give a true uh, and honest picture of their performance. Do they have very little understanding? Do they have a simple understanding uh, with a limited and inconsistent approach uh, to how much help they need? Or are they working at the highest level here called progressing where they have a partial understanding of uh, selected standards and they are steadily learning new knowledge and skills, uh, providing a basically accurate and a mostly um, independent performance. So, these are, the, these are the descriptors we use for these performance levels. And um, let's move to the next slide here. And um, we want to make sure you understand that progressing, although it's the highest score for an MCAT salt, um, and it means that the student is steadily progressing and learning new skills. Uh, they are doing that mostly independently by the end of the instruction you've provided them. They're giving a basically an accurate performance. Uh, but they're still achieving well below grade level expectations. And so the, um, the legislature and the, uh, the laws of Massachusetts uh, require that a student meet a certain level of performance to be eligible to earn a diploma. Uh, the students who are taking the MCAS all, even at the progressing level, uh, don't reach those standards and therefore they're not uh, eligible to earn a diploma. And they're generally included with the school's results in the lowest performance level uh, for that particular assessment. Just uh, an, an injecting a note of honesty here about how these results get reported. You do get credit for these for accountability, but for in terms of the school results, we're also honest about how we, um, how we gauge those students' performance. Okay. Now here are some strategies, some effective strategies to help you through the process of uh, conducting the alternate assessment. We're suggesting that you're creating a, a sort of a continuation or a snapshot of what you're already teaching. Uh, cohesive units for science that hold together, 
Uh, what goals are you working on every day for reading comprehension? What kinds of writing assignments, if any, are you providing students? And are they um, are they you know expressing themselves in one literary text form or another? Uh, which which units align with the standards taught to other students in your grade? And how are you going to collect the data on this? Uh, it's a, it's easier if this is already part of your teaching and not separate and apart from that. Uh, we want to suggest that you may want to reach out uh, to grade level content uh, teachers uh, to get ideas or understand what some of the standards are saying, particularly in mathematics and science, uh, so that you can adapt uh, lesson plans in that area uh, to assess meaningfully and appropriately. Uh, are there ways in which students can participate even occasionally in an inclusive setting? or inviting uh, general education peers into their setting for a lesson or an activity. And just encouragement to try new and different kinds of self-evaluation, uh, because we know that kids get used to this and it comes easier to them to talk about what they learned and how they learned and what they want to learn next and where they need help. This is all a skill that's gained over time. And so we want to um, and ask you to think about making this a way that you, a way and a part of that um, process that you already use to run your classroom. So here are some tips that we uh, try to relay to you each year from our scores. Maybe some of you have heard these before. Um, there are lots of ways to make uh, the, the scoring process and um, the compilation of a portfolio easier. Uh, for you, for us, for our scorers, um, and to go back and look at look for a strand when these portfolios are returned to you. Uh, we'd like to suggest that you use some method. Uh, we're not asking you to go out and buy anything if you don't already have them, um, but to separate the strands of a portfolio in some way, even using post-its or flags or colored paper, or if you wish, you can use divider tabs or some other method between each strand if that's possible. We're asking you to uh, get rid of those staples, get rid of those sheet protectors. Uh, that's another step for you. The sheet protectors are a large pain to our scorers to pull the work out, review them, get them back in there. Uh, we don't need them. We can just have you poke holes uh, in the samples and the descriptions and, and just put them in the binder without the sheet protectors. Let's make sure to remember that we need strand cover sheets, then the skills survey, the data chart if it's required, and then the primary and supporting evidence for each of the strands. Uh, there's a checklist for you to use to make sure you're not missing any of this. Again, in the educator's manual, page 23, you can look at that checklist, print it out, have it at the ready to see that uh, everything's included. Uh, we wanna make sure that you remember to pre-score your students' writing samples using our uh, state provided rubric for that purpose. Um, and we'd like to ask that you list the same date as the writing sample it's intended to score or uh, relate to on there so that we can match them up. Sometimes these writing samples and rubrics come in in a bit of a jumble and we have to do a little detective work to put them together. So that would be helpful to list the same date as on the writing sample. Um, make sure that if you're taking pictures of students, you include uh, a photo consent form. You don't have to submit that, just keep that at the school. Uh, but parents get very upset, obviously, if you include an image of their child without their permission. So we have a photo consent form in the educator's manual that you can use for that purpose. Um, it would be a, a wonderful help to us if you could remember to list any of the accommodations you used for students on the strand cover sheet the activities that that strain cover sheet uh, covers. We, we want to know um, how activities were modified and accommodated for students. It would help if you let us know if the responses were scribed by a teacher or if there was some way in which a student used a calculator uh, on, a, on a, you know, a mathematics uh, worksheet or whatever that was. Uh, let us know so we know how much uh, independence the student had and how much they were accommodated or assisted. There are lots of opportunities for student input here. We want to see the student in these portfolios, and most of the time we do. But we'd like to see the student um, creating their own artistic cover. We'd like to see them writing or dictating their student introduction. 
the self-evaluations examples and so on. And the evidence itself uh, should also reflect the student's input as much as possible. So we would say that a student-centered assessment includes, of course, the MCAS alt skills survey uh, that you may want to complete early in the year. Just get that done so you know what you have uh, at the ready to select your entry points. Uh, you want to make sure that it correctly documents the student's abilities and helps you to identify a meaningful and challenging entry point. Uh, and that entry point then becomes a measurable outcome that reflects a skill that the student has not yet learned. And so we know that students participate in the same activities sometimes uh, together in the same classroom, but every student really should be working at their own level. And so there are some acceptable modifications that you can apply to the entry points. Uh, they're described in the educator's manual on the pages listed here. Uh, sometimes we can pre-approve an entry point if it isn't listed in the educator's manual or, or the uh, resource guide, sorry. Um, we want to make sure that you uh, don't go off on your own creating entry points, working on them only to find that we have no idea where you got that entry point from. Um, so also that you may require some consultation along the way with the content specialist. Some of the new science standards and the science practices and the mathematics standards are pretty complex. And we had to work uh, with our content specialists at the department to understand their meaning. We want to um, relay to you that this, this may be uh, necessary uh, in your particular school or program. You may just need to work with the content specialist to just clarify what that standard is asking. Some, uh, some pointers to remember for data charts is that we want to make sure that the first data point does not show accuracy or independence at 80 plus percent. 80 plus accuracy and 80 plus independence on the first data point is a no-no because that means that the student already knows the skill and they're not working on a challenging new skill. We want to clearly document the student's responses and that comes, uh, comes into the brief descriptions at the bottom. Uh, we're going to ask you to try and allow students to attempt the skill independently. We've seen an awful lot of 100% accuracy and 0% independence data charts where the student is never allowed to attempt the skill by themselves. That maybe that they need an accommodation or a modification or a different communication system, but we'd like to encourage you to allow students to, uh, to attempt these activities by themselves if possible. We also think that a 0% accurate and a 0% independent uh, data point means that the student refused to participate. Nothing happened. We weren't able to see any uh, visible means of a student trying to attempt to, uh, to learn the skill. And so just leave that point off, leave it out, and come back to this maybe another time, another day, and have them do the activity again. It, it appears that uh, the student just wasn't in the mood to participate that day. Let's make sure our brief descriptions align with the activity and the skills. We've seen uh, several activities that don't quite align with the measurable outcome. Uh, so we want to make sure the activity is based on the skill being assessed. This is where your content experts may be helpful to uh, reassure you that that's the case. Uh, let us know what the student did and how the skill was addressed. And that might include the method of instruction or how they responded or how an activity was presented to them and so forth. And please describe only the skills in the measurable outcome. And in this way, I'm quite confident that we'll bring way down the number of uh, incomplete portfolios this year, coupled with having a hopefully complete school year in which to do all of this. We can, we can see only from this, the purpose of this is that um, you can see that a perfectly good brief description is able to fit in that box uh, without spilling over. You know that when you print this out, if it's longer than the box, then it comes out on a second page. And so uh, look at how you're explaining the activity. Maybe you can cut out some of the words and fit it all in the box. But um, you know what, what was the student doing? What do they do? And how do they do it? That's the simple brief description here. OK. 
We want to make sure evidence is the work of the student from 2021, 2022, not from last year and not somebody else's work. Uh, we want to clearly show the final product. Uh, we suggest using the work sample descriptions because they help you remember to include certain pieces of information. Uh, to think about establishing a primary mode of communication if it doesn't exist. And again, to make sure that the science activities are aligned to the core idea and with the practice that you've selected. There are examples of teacher scribed work samples if you feel you need to use these uh, at the web address at the bottom of this particular slide. Now, these are for students who don't typically produce any sorts of written samples, but you can see those examples on our material site and uh, have a look and see whether these might be appropriate for your student. Let's move along. Uh, supporting documentation can be helpful to us in determining how your activity was conducted because we see things like communication boards and um, uh, the setup, the games, the um, instructional models or activities that were used with students uh, to, to perform diff different activities. So while these aren't scored unto themselves, they can be very helpful to us in, in determining what we're looking at in the actual primary evidence that is scored. Now we wanna point you to a resource that we think will be helpful. It's at our materials website. It's called the Checking for Completeness Worksheet. It is a, um, a guide to the questions that our scorers use when they score your portfolio. So if you wanna see how your portfolio is scored and why it may have scored a no when you had hoped it would be a yes, you can look at these questions and just go through this briefly and answer these questions and make sure what your charts and data, uh, sorry, charts and primary evidence show uh, were included in your strand. And so this is um, by way of being a helpful tool for you before these get submitted in April. Uh, finally, let's make sure that um, at our team meetings, we're using the decision-making tool for MCAS. This is something that we developed to make sure that we're um, not including students who are inappropriate for the MCAS salt, but that every student is taking the right assessment. And on the next slide, you can see uh, that there are a number of resources in how to make this particular judgment. There are notification letters for parents, which are required if you're taking the uh, MCAS salt. There is a training presentation for teams and so on. Here are the important dates that we'd like you to remember as we come down the home stretch. I know we're a little over, I apologize. Uh, we're ordering materials January 3rd through 14th. You'll receive those in February. <clears throat> Your pickup needs to be scheduled on March 31st for pickup on Friday, April 1st. And then we will be per, um, posting the feedback forms in mid-June. Finally, if you need to contact us, here are our names, our contact uh, email addresses, uh, the, the webpage, the MCAS Salt Materials website, and the Service Center phone numbers. And I realize we're galloping through this because we're over by a few minutes, but we want to thank you for joining us. Um, you spent uh, valuable time with us. We appreciate it. And we hope to see you at a, on another training in uh, perhaps in January. So thanks for joining us. Have a great day. See you soon.